Hi guys, I'm Davey Jarrell, and welcome to another episode of the Animation Resources podcast series, Animated Discussions. I'm a storyboard artist in TV animation, and serve as the Director of Programming at Animation Resources. You can sign up for our membership at animationresources.org slash membership. One more time, that's animationresources.org slash membership. So, today's episode features an interview that Animation Resources President Stephen Wirth did on Jennifer Crittenton's podcast, Books, Shows, Tunes, and Mad Acts. He shares the history and mission behind Animation Resources, the untapped potential of animation as an art form, and his theories on creativity. Let's jump right in. I'm so pleased to welcome a new guest to the show today, Stephen Wirth is with us, and also Bill Aho is with us. Uh, so we've got three as a crowd in the studio today. I'll, I'll start by introducing Stephen. He has been an animation producer for the past 35 years, and he's been serving on boards of nonprofit arts organizations for almost as long. He's the president of Animation Resources, a 501c3 nonprofit organization serving animators, cartoonists, and illustrators worldwide. That's mostly what we're going to talk about today is that project. The digital archive Stephen oversees contains over 150,000 high resolution scans and over 10,000 hours of rare animated films and television programs. Animation Resources curates these treasures for their membership into what they call, quote, reference packs. These are monthly downloadable collections of articles, ebooks, podcasts, and still frameable video files. Their advisory board includes animation luminaries like Ralph Bakshi, Will Finn, and JJ Sadelmeyer, and they have members all over the world. So welcome to the show, Steve. Thank you very much. Okay, let's uh, define our terms, as my dad, okay. the physicist, would say. So what does, <laughs> quote, animation mean for you? Well, let's see. Um, Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnston, who were Disney animators, uh, they defined animation as the illusion of life. Oh. Basically, mannerisms, little personality quirks, uh, relatable behavior, things we recognize and instantly identify with. Like if you've got a cartoon cat and it stretches, you look at it and you say, oh, my cat stretches exactly like that. And there's like a connection, a bond between mm. the human and yourself and the drawing. Um, we see, you know, Donald Duck getting frustrated. We see wolves hooting and hollering at pretty girls. But we look at the drawings, but what we're actually seeing is ourselves. And today with technology, there's been an addition to that that kind of modifies what it is. Special effects have gotten so important in animation. And it isn't really using those little personality quirks and things. It's more um, an illusion of reality. Uh, when we see Spider-Man climbing a building, uh, everything looks real. You know, the lighting is natural. The... Uh, movement is natural uh so it's more of animation as a technique than a medium of creativity the way frank thomas and ollie johnston saw it and are special effects really animation well that's a definition that other people get to figure out uh, but it, it's using computers in a way that disney never dreamed of mm -hmm. um at the same time though it can kind of remove animation's ability to create fantastical images that are expressive and and feel real without looking actually real. You know, a cartoon character is a symbol of a person. To me though, my definition of what animation is, is it's the unification of all art forms. Ah. Oh. Um, Richard Wagner, the, the composer, <laughs> uh, he wrote, Ring of the Nibelung and that uh, kill the wabbit, kill the wabbit <laughs> that went on for like 19 hours long and made everyone fall asleep. Or, in any case, Richard, Richard Wagner said that opera was the synthesis of all art forms because it's drama, it's music, it's writing, it's stagecraft, 
but animation takes it one step further because animation incorporates cinema and drawing and painting and even sculpture with puppets and CGI. You know, some people say, I only like hand-drawn animation, or I only like CG, or I only like puppets. But it isn't about hand drawings or puppets or CGI. The core, what do you call it? The granular core of animation is essentially the manipulation of time. Animators break the world down into 24 frames a second and arrange those drawings or puppets or whatever into a frame of, of time, 1 24th of a second. And the continuity of that creates a reality that never actually existed. And that's really the secret behind animation that nobody really realizes. It's, it's time. Wow. That's really fascinating. Yeah, <laughs> there are so many different things going on there. Yeah, at first I was thinking, at least in the comparison between sort of the analog drawings and then what we have now, Spider-Man climbing up the building, mm -hmm. I was thinking, yeah, there's much more imagination required in the first one and maybe less in the second. But yeah, that, that doesn't really address the whole issue of time. Uh, special effects, uh, you know, sometimes they cross the line into, into being, well, I guess you could say character animation. If you look at uh, King Kong 1933, He's making facial expressions. He's he's looking at uh, uh, was it Fay Ray? I think yeah. Fay Ray in that movie. Yeah, mm -hmm. he's looking at her and and his eyes widen and, and you know he's picking her up out of the the bedroom in the sky rise. That's special effects that actually has a um, actually has that character animation base to it. But there's also uh, animation done for special effects that's just pure technique pure pure technical exercise as opposed to creativity or performance like acting because again frank thomas and ollie johnston called animators actors with pencils oh yeah and there's a famous scene in in sleeping beauty where um briar rose meets the prince in the forest and and the prince grabs her hand and she tries to run away and he's, he's saying, you know, uh, who are you? That sort of thing. And what it actually is when, you're look, when you look at it and you think about it is it's Milt Call animating the prince. And it's um, Mark Davis animating uh, Briar Rose. It's essentially two middle-aged men having a love scene. <laughs> <laughs> Not that they might admit that, but... <laughs> Well, as an animator, you get to be everything. You yeah, know, you, it's you, true. Uh -huh. You're not limited by your own appearance the way actors are. Right. Yeah, exactly. Uh -huh. The whole world is open to you. I mean, really, then it, the only limit is your own imagination, right? As an animator. That's the platitude that they all say. But the problem is when you actually sit down and have to figure everything out, then then your imagination actually does become limited. There, there are some very complex problems. Um, that animators solve and it involves mathematics as much as it does art mm -hmm. uh, timing is all divisions of 24 frames a second so the reason they pick 24 frames is because 24 frames cuts in half several times 12 6 3 um, so you can speed things up by just having the number of frames that something take, takes to happen so animators really have to be have a lot of concentration. It's not just uh, imagination and fun. Everyone thinks that, that, you know, they watch the supplements on the DVDs and they think, oh gosh, those people must be having a lot of fun. But actually, you know, that they, they asked Art Babbitt, who did the mushrooms in, in uh, Fantasia, what drugs he was taking. <laughs> and he said, oh yeah, we took drugs, Pepto-Bismol and X-Lax. <laughs> Right. As it's a, a lot of work. Yeah. Of just the elbow grease, the hard work yeah. that goes into it. Yeah. I mean, I think people became somewhat aware of that with the illustrations for Disney that you had just, a, you know, a large group of people just hard at work grinding out these drawings. Yeah. Disney had a factory. It was essentially a factory. But you're saying there's still there, there's still a lot of elbow grease involved. 
Oh yeah, computers don't do everything. <laughs> that that changes every time. Every time. Every time the computer can do something new, then you want to add more to it. So, right. Yeah. Um, it. Uh, I think that's an endless thing, and that's why animation should be getting better, not worse. It should be improving as technology takes takes some of the load mm -hmm. off of us that theoretically should give us more time for creativity that's that's what we're hoping at least that's the theory right that's always the theory <laughs> all right so to switch gears on you a little bit here so tell us what animation resources uh, your program and the website currently offers its members and what are your dreams for what it might offer to them one day Oh gosh. Well, the first question is easier to answer. Yeah, for um, sure. <laughs> <laughs> our our members get what you described earlier, uh, reference packs. Mm -hmm. We put together, we have this huge archive of material. We curate that into ebooks and uh, video downloads. The ebooks are are on all of the subjects that we cover: cartooning and illustration and art instruction. Uh, the video downloads include uh, rare animated films from all over the world mm -hmm. and uh, documentaries on filmmaking. They're all still frameable for study, which is an animator understands that. When you go to YouTube and you want to still frame through it and try and see, break down the action and figure out how something works, YouTube doesn't do that. <laughs> You can't still frame forward and backward real well in in YouTube because it's compressing it. It jump, if I recall, it sort of jumps forward pretty far. Yeah, and if you want to like analyze a movement, if you have a baseball pitcher and he's throwing a ball, you want to see each individual frame of that. Um, so what we do is all of our our videos are uh, still frameable. We break them down to pure 24 frames a second. Oh, that's what you mean. Gotcha. So an animator can take the films that we're, we're sharing with them and actually go through and see each individual drawing in them. Oh, so, um, that, so that's quite valuable, actually. Yeah, and it's, it's something that's very specific to animators. Mm -hmm. Another thing that we share are uh, videos of slapstick comedy. Um, Charlie Chaplin, Buster Keaton, Harold Lloyd. Fine. These were the things that they studied back in the 30s. Uh, it's pure pantomime acting, which is what animation does best. They would have what they called action analysis classes at uh, Disney back in the 30s, where they would take Charlie Chaplin and a, a single frame through it to show how he was uh, doing what he did. And, and like I say, still framing, um, there was a film called 1AM where Chaplin is a, is a drunk and he's coming home from uh, a bender and he's trying to get in his front door, but the door is locked and he's so drunk that his key is going around in circles and can't find the hole in the door, right? <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. So the animators took this and they went through frame by frame and they showed how he anticipated by raising his hand before he shoved it down in his pocket to grab the key so your eye looks over to the arm when he pulls it out he flicks the key up and it catches a glint of light so the audience sees the key so that by the time he's trying to put it in the in the keyhole you've already known exactly what he's thinking. And this pantomime acting um, is a way of conveying information without words. And that's what, what slapstick is. Uh, silent films in general are um, so important for. Um, we also have a new category that we're, we're, we've added to the reference packs called sidetracks. And what that is, is kind of an inter interdisciplinary sort of thing. Documentaries on, on other art forms to show the relationship between animation and other kinds of creativity. Oh, neat. Um, essentially, animation, an animator may be called on to dance. An animator may be called on to understand architecture. Hmm. An animator may be uh, 
involved with with uh, essentially it painting any kind of art form. So when we share documentaries on uh, other forms of art, it relates back to animation. Um, so what happens is we, we give all this stuff to our members, they download it and they organize it on their hard drives. It, these are all professional animators or students or people who are, are learning to animate. Mm -hmm. They download it to their hard drives and it becomes a virtual reference library. Nice. Uh, in the old days, every artist had a clip file where they organized pictures. You know, they'd cut things out of magazines and, and oh. organize them by subject. Here's interior living rooms. Here's pictures of dogs. So that when they were come to design something, they would have a reference uh, for it. So today, artists do that exact same thing on their computer. Google is great, mm -hmm. but Google is this huge randomizer and artists know what they're looking for. And uh, there's no reason anymore to have libraries with huge banks of uh, bookcases with, you know, dusty books on them. You, you can have it on your computer and just type in a keyword for what you're looking for and bang, you've got it right in your hand. Um, that's the great thing about about the internet about and about computers so that kind of leads me to what we might want to offer one day uh, as the internet gets to be more advanced we've been building a digital database and what this is is it's digitized information as you said in the beginning we have hundreds of thousands of high resolution images we scan at 1200 dots per inch. So you can actually see the fibers in the paper. It's that good. Um, all of the oh. pixel dots, you know, that make up newspaper comics, every one of those is absolutely perfectly scanned. So we have thousands and thousands of those. We have tens of thousands of hours of uh, still frameable films. We And then there's biographical data about artists. Mm. All these are in a single database and it's all interrelate, interrelated so that you can go in and say, Ub Iwerks, the man who created Mickey Mouse. You can type in his name. It comes up with his biography, has a list of the, the films that he worked on. You click on the name of the film and that comes up with a video of the film that you can watch. And then you click again and it takes you to drawings by Ub Iwerks from that film. So it's a way of organizing information into interrelated database that is searchable the way artists want to search for things. That's something that hasn't ever really been done before. And it still isn't quite to the point where uh, it's possible yet. However, time goes, hold on a moment. I'm having technical problems here. Computer is acting up as usual. Speaking of computers. I'm talking about how great, how great <laughs> computers are and it's, it starts misbehaving on me. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah. Na, 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 na. <laughs> so lately, my thinking, though, has changed a little bit about the internet and masses of data in huge databases. You know, I, I mentioned just a second ago that Google is this great randomizer. I, I've come to the realization that big masses of data aren't really useful by themselves because people tend to kind of glaze over at large oceans of information like, like the internet. And it becomes like searching for needles in haystacks. And you tend to look at the things that you've already looked at. Um, people oh. can come into the archive and uh, the, uh, I'll have all of this material on a database that they can look at. And they say, do you have anything by Walt Disney? Or do you have anything by Chuck Jones that are like, you can get information on them absolutely anywhere. Oh, so the important thing that we're really offering is curation mm -hmm. and curation has a value. Uh, it's weeding out the bad stuff and, organizing the good stuff into a context, it makes it so it's a directly applicable to an artist's work. 
as a society, modern people don't tend to value curation especially on the internet. You know, everything's supposed to be free on the internet, right? Yeah. And But what about the hours and hours and hours people spend organizing all of that material for you? Do they have to do that just for free? But, you know, you mm-hmm. get what you pay for. If you just do a random search in Google, you get random information. And it may be that people, they don't even understand what curation is. You know, you, you type a word into Google and the information comes out like a vending machine. Mm -hmm. Um, But the truth is that the context is everything. And you have all this accumulated knowledge of the world, but it's just a pile of stuff until you start sorting it and putting it into order and organizing it so that it allows you to use the information. And that's what Animation Resources is all about. It's packaging large amounts of information into little chunks that are digestible that um, allow you to directly apply it. Because what we're looking for is to not go back to the golden age of animation. We want to create a new golden age. And the way you do that is by building on the past. So everything that's in our archive is, is a foundation that people could, could build upon, theoretically. That's pretty valuable. Yeah, it sounds really valuable. I was thinking when you were just talking about, you know, sort of the package, I was thinking, well, this sounds like a series of search terms that I would put in, like, Mm -hmm. okay, give me a bio of the guy. Okay, now let me see the film that I'm interested in. Okay, But I would have to know what questions to ask. And who, what you're looking for. Exactly, which I may not know. And then once I get back the whole, you know, the internet throwing up on me once I've asked, assuming that I first <laughs> compose a reasonable search term, right? Then it throws up on me and then I have to sort through all that garbage. So no, I can definitely see the value of that, especially in situations where I don't know what questions to ask, right? Like it turns out he had a partner who was also uh, an animator. I don't, you know, I would, my, I could potentially be completely clueless about that. I read an article that talked about libraries and books because mm-hmm. people don't have books so much as they used to. They don't read the way they used to. But it said that having a huge library of books, it doesn't even matter if you haven't read them yet because potential knowledge mm-hmm. is better than a little bit of knowledge that you already have. And it isn't the things that you know that are important. It's the things that you haven't learned yet Mm -hmm. that are the ones that you really need to focus on. Which, you know, I always try to find people who are smarter than me. I I like to hang out with people that know more things than me because I can just sit there and, you know, when I was a kid, I I would hang out with with animators. Uh, I found the Asifa Hollywood, which was the, organization where they were all members and I'd sit behind them and take notes. They'd say, uh, uh, I was looking at this thing by Daumier the other day. I'd write Daumier down, you know, and, and uh, then I'd go look for it. It's much easier now with the, with Google, but knowing those search terms is the trick. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's kind of like breadcrumbs. Mm-hmm. Uh, you follow around someone who knows what they're doing and you pick up their breadcrumbs as they drop them. <laughs> and uh-huh. chase them down. So that's kind of what uh, what I try to do is I try to drop lots of bread crumb crumbs for uh, young artists who are looking to get beyond what they already know, what they grew up with, and start getting into things that that expand their vision of what animation can be. Because we look at animation, and it all looks the same. And there's no reason for that. Uh, animation can look like anything. There's no reason why it's all talking dogs and princesses and and uh, space princes. It could be something completely different. It could be, you know, you look at live action films and they have westerns and they have horror movies and they have romances and they have dramas and crime and and you look at animation and it's the same things over and over again. Mm. And there's no reason for that. So. Looking beyond what you already know is so important. Animation should be 
using other art forms for uh, inspiration, not making animation that looks like other animation. Yeah, also a very interesting point. Yeah, it occurs to me, you know, we're seeing animation being used a lot for teaching, right? Because now you can represent sort of natural sequences of events, you know, a plant growing or Yeah, that's actually something that we've been we've been doing research on at Animation Resources. That goes back to actually World War II when um they were training uh, the military, how to use a gun or how to, how to, uh, fire, uh, a, a, uh, a gun on a ship so that it lands, you know, we, we, we know missile command and all those, those, those games where you shoot ahead of the target so that it, by the time it gets there, it lands on the target. They had to actually teach that to the, to the sailors on the ships because, they didn't have video games yet. They didn't know any of that <laughs> stuff. So there's actually a, a training film, an animated training film that shows how you you uh, judge where ahead of the target, depending mm -hmm. on how fast the target's going and how far away it is. Training films are, are fascinating. There's also industrial films that were used to explain things like insurance or medicine or uh, uh, democracy, uh, all kinds of things. In, in the 50s in particular, they did great documentary, uh, uh, little animated films, just letting people know how things worked. Mm -hmm. They were ephemeral, they didn't last long. They were intended for a specific time and place and then, then they were essentially just thrown out. And we have a, one of our advisory board members who is a film archivist who mm -hmm. finds these things and makes transfers of them. And they're incredible. There's a lot of them at archive.org too. If you search uh, animated industrial film, that'll get you some really interesting things to watch. I, I've seen some of those and it's, it's like they, because they're not real long, they can really go more with um, modern styling and different things. I mean, there's some really cool mm -hmm. styling and stuff that basically the fifties and sixties look. That you don't normally see yeah and they had you know when it, when someone would get laid off at warner brothers or disney they'd go over to these industrial films studios and they'd work there so some of the top people worked on these films that it, it's the best animators in the business some of them so uh incredible animation and the, the thing about cartooning in general is that it's able to distill an idea down into the word for it is incontrovertible. You look at it and you understand it and you grasp it. And it's so clear that nothing else could be true. That, I mean, it, it's the truth of something. That's what uh, political uh, cartoons and newspapers work with. They boil an idea down and present an image to you that you can't disagree with because it's just so clear and that's what uh, educational animation taps into and it it makes it much easier to learn things when you're when you're visually uh conceiving of them in a in a film like that okay i'm going to jump gears a little bit here and uh because of all the people you have working with you and all the um archiving and different things i'm sure there must be something of a holy grail that you wish you could find or are always kind of keeping your eyes open for? I mean, what would you call the holy grail for you guys? <laughs> well, I'll tell you where you can find the holy grail. eBay. <laughs> Even <better>. eBay. <laughs> oh. eBay is the place. Yeah, it's the greatest archive. It's the greatest museum on earth. It, it, eBay. You know, it, it's crazy. Everything turns up there eventually. If you have the right search terms in there, incredible treasures turn up on eBay. I'm, I'm constantly uh, scouring eBay. And, and the thing is, is that a lot of the stuff that I'm looking for, uh, nobody knows anything about. So it, it costs next to nothing. Mm -hmm. And I'm buying 100 year old cartoons for, for next to nothing on eBay because nobody knows to search for them. Um, there are certain things that I'm looking for uh, personally, myself, my own interests, um, I collect um, TV character mascot cells. 
um, you know, like uh, Tony the Tiger and Snap, Crackle and Pop. Um, I, I loved that stuff when I was a kid. The Trix Rabbit was animated in New York. I met the guy who animated and he said that he had a crate out in his barn. <laughs> 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 but I could never get him to go go dig it out and I've never seen any 60s Trix rabbit art and I'd love to see that that that's my holy grail of animation art okay so it yeah that the, the request is out to our audience to produce <laughs> that <laughs> there's lots of stuff from the 90s and from the 80s but nothing from the 60s that's the huh. the period when it, Trix rabbit was the most fun you know tricks are for kids and all that. The other thing that I, I'm constantly searching for on eBay are pre-war character journals. In the, in the years between the turn of the century and through World War I, around the world, printing, four-color printing, was uh, becoming prevalent everywhere. There were these caricature journals that were political kind of like an adult version of Mad Magazine, where they mm -hmm. would make fun of politicians and, and they'd have cartoons in them and, and humor. Um, they were very hard hitting. Kind of like Punch um, Magazine, that kind of thing back in the day? Exactly. Or? Punch, okay. Puck, Judge, uh, Simplicismus in Germany, Clatterash, Lerere. There were ones in France that Gustave Doré drew for, uh, Fliegen de Blatter. It, it was a golden age of magazine cartooning. Uh, and it, it's amazing. You know, you can even find these in Japan or South America or uh, the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. And no one, I don't think, has ever done a, a study of all of these caricature journals. But, but it would be fascinating to get a list of all of the names because then, mm -hmm. then I could enter in eBay and find all my <laughs> treasures. Yeah, just the ones you've listed sound really interesting. Yeah, uh, it. Uh, I read a um, uh, how-to cartooning book that was written in 1917. Wow. And it was from New York. It was by uh, uh, Eugene Zimmerman. And in there, he gives tips. And one of the tips he gives is to go to a certain newsstand in New York City and to tell them that you're interested in these titles, and then he lists Lerere and Simplicismus and Clatterash, Flick in the Blotter. He lists these there and he says, have them get you copies of these. <laughs> so I saw that in this, in this uh, how-to cartooning book. So I started Googling the names. That's where I found out. It's it, it breadcrumbs. It's all mm -hmm. breadcrumbs. Um, another thing I've been getting into that's my current uh, frenzy passionate frenzy is um, Japanese prints. Uh, it's called Okiyue, which are the, um, you know, the horizontal prints or vertical prints that you see of uh, beautiful um, geisha girls or of uh, uh, landscapes, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. They were the equivalent of cartoons in Japan. And we tend to think of them as pictures, just mm -hmm. pretty pictures because we don't understand what the actual meaning behind them is. Mm -hmm. But the purpose of Okeoe was not to depict something the way it looked, but to depict the way it felt to be <laughs> at that place. Um, so the landscape and the, and the things that are there, you know, they may put snow on the ground when it never snows there, just oh. because that's the feeling that that, that place gives to them. That's why uh, these Ukiyo-e prints were so important to people like Vincent van Gogh. Um, they were using, they were basically throwaway. They were, they were like comic books. You'd get a print of a, of a kabuki actor, you know, with the cross eyes and the, and the big sword and all that stuff. And you'd hang it on your wall for a while and then you'd throw it in the fireplace and, and get another picture to hang on the wall. And they were using them to wrap China that was being shipped from um, Japan to France. France was importing porcelain from Japan. And they were wrapping them in these Ukeoe prints. The people that were importing them unwrapped the China and then realized that the wrapping was something that they wanted. 
So in Japan, they started shipping their trash <laughs> to, <laughs> to <friends>. really? <laughs> Well, if you like that, maybe you'll like this. Yeah. And museums were buying it. All their trash ended up in, in the Louvre. <laughs> <laughs> Those crazy Europeans. <laughs> <laughs> So tell us the history of animation resources. Well, gosh, that's almost 40 years. Wow. Um, well, how did it start? Who, who had the idea and what were the resources to get it started to begin with? Well, in the very beginning, I was in college and I heard about uh, an event that was taking place at a local mall uh, put on by a group called Asifa Hollywood. Uh, Asifa is, uh, I'm probably one of the few people on earth who know what ASIFA stands for. It's Association Society Internationale du Film Animation. It's French. It was uh, founded as part of UNESCO. Oh. And uh, in Hollywood, the animators were having trouble importing uh, animated films from Zagreb or Russia or Iron Curtain countries, and they wanted to see these films. And there was great animation being done behind the Iron Curtain, but because of politics, it was impossible to get them, copies of them to see. So what they did is they created this, this UNESCO chartered nonprofit that made it easier for them to ship our films to, to Russia and for Russia to ship their films to us uh, for screenings. The president at the time, they did this, uh, what was called an animation art festival at this, um, this mall. And they had stage shows where uh, June Foray and Bill Scott, the voice of Rocky and Bullwinkle, would read Rocky and Bullwinkle scripts. They had Chuck Jones sitting at a, at a desk drawing pictures of, of Daffy Duck for people. They had Grim Natwick who created Betty Boop and animated Snow White signing autographs. And then they had all these cells that had been donated by local um, animation studios of TV commercials. This is where my passion for TV commercial cells came from. And they were selling them for $20, $30 a piece. And that was their main fundraiser for the year. Well, I went to this and I said, this is an organization I got to be a part of. So I immediately signed up as a volunteer. And the very first day that I volunteered, they brought in big boxes of cells and we were taking them out and sorting them into setups so that, you know, it'd be all the elements that went together in a scene. And then we'd put them in a mat that they could use then to sell at cell sales. I'm doing this and behind me, I hear a voice that sounds an awful lot laughing, sounding like super chicken. <laughs> and I turn around and it was Bill Scott and I recognized him because I'd seen him at the animation art festival. And he spots me and he walks across the room, points at me and walks across the room. And he says, you, I don't think I've seen you here before. And I'm like, I'm, this is like incredible. You know, and here's this great animator coming over to say hello to me. And he said, you know, you're interested in volunteering. I've got lots of things that you can help me with. And one of them is, uh, cinema is an anima tech and the idea was that he wanted to build a workshop museum library and screening room in hollywood that would be kind of the center of the animation industry of, of the anime of people who were interested in animation at that point this was the 1982 i think mm -hmm. at that point there wasn't funding to pull something like that off the old guard of, a, I, I got involved with ASIFA, I uh, attended the board meetings and met all of the famous animators that were involved with ASIFA. And uh, they started retiring and moving out and the volunteers started moving up into becoming board members. And uh, Antron Manugian, who I, was a friend of mine and a volunteer, we, were, we would haul boxes of cells around together ended up being president. I ended up being on the board of directors. And we uh, revamped the Annie Awards, which had been a lifetime achievement award up to that point, to make it more, you know, like best picture, best short, best commercial, that sort of thing. The Annie Awards just took off and became huge. We were doing uh, shows at, at uh, Royce Hall in mm. UCLA and um, 
big black tie events, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, we got to the point where we'd done everything we could do with the Annie Awards. And we said that we really should have something else. The Annie Awards is great, but there should be another project that um, we start seeding now. And that was, I look, remembered back to what Bill Scott was talking about. Mm -hmm. And I said, why don't we create uh, Bill Scott's Animatech? And so we got a little tiny storefront on Victory Boulevard in Burbank, and and we did did um, art shows and started building uh, a, a sort of a center, an animation center. Mm -hmm. And I was shutting down a studio that I'd been working at for a long time when we we all got laid off, and I was packing the library up into into boxes. And I thought to myself, this would have been about two thousand three, I guess, maybe. I thought to myself, you know, the internet and computers are great. A book in a box does nobody, anybody, mm -hmm. any good. But if I digitize this, if I scan it and put it on the internet, then everybody can benefit from it. And that archive became the Animation Archive Project. And ASIFA sponsored me to create this Animation Archive as a kind of a uh, prototype. In 2011, ASIFA decided that they wanted to focus more on other things. And we, the volunteers that had been working on the archive, created new 501c3 uh, animation resources and made that a membership organization in 2013. So it's kind of a long road with the same idea at the beginning as the end and as at the end. Um, but we did it in a step-by-step -step process and mm -hmm. the wind blows one way and you, you have to bend with the wind, <laughs> wind blows the other way. But I'm really proud of how far we've taken animation resources uh, in the past 10 years since we established it. Our organization isn't huge, but looking at our membership roles, it's, it's a who's who of animation. Isn't that great? So rewarding. A, really good students too, really on the ball kinds of uh, young artists that are, that really want to take the art form forward. And I'm happy to be a catalyst and, you know, uh, encourage these, these people to do great things and, and share when all this stuff, yeah, all this stuff is just so important to, to get distributed so that people don't end up here in Hollywood. We're kind of spoiled. Um, we have all these resources. We have the Academy. We have mm -hmm. uh, a CIFA. We have all of these things. And what if you're an animator and you live in, in Cincinnati? Yeah. You know, what, what if you're an animator and you live in, in Poland, mm -hmm. you know, it, I want to see the internet become this animatech for the entire world. That's, that's kind of the goal of what animation resources is. And we'll do it as a nonprofit on an as can basis. That's the thing about nonprofits. Uh, if there's a person there, you know, everyone knows what a nonprofit should do, should do. They say, oh, you have to do this, you need to do that, all that sort of thing. But until there's someone to actually do it, to sit down and roll up their sleeves and, and actually do it, it doesn't get done. So we work with the resources that we have and do as much as we can. And I'm really proud of what we've accomplished so far. Oh, it should be. It's really a remarkable endeavor and, and resource. Yeah. I know you have the, the internet and all that kind of thing, but is there any chance that someday you may want to work toward doing a museum where you could show more of these things that, because sometimes, I mean, the computers are nice, the internet's nice, and you can see a lot of stuff, but sometimes just seeing the artwork or different things in person it's a whole new level because people don't have necessarily good screens, good computers, all that kind of stuff. And and they see a picture, but they don't see the detail or the, the quality that goes into it. Uh, I kind of like, like with the old backdrops for things. I mean, Ivan Earl did the, Fant the Fantasia stuff and that stuff is art in itself. And, and I don't know how well that comes across. Yeah, I, you know, early on, our goal was to have a museum. We had a small scale one in Burbank at, with Asifa. There are, are museums that deal with animation. There's the Walt Disney Family Museum up north. Oh, 
Oh. Um, there's a, the Academy Museum. But the thing is, the Walt Disney Family Museum is about Walt Disney. It's not really sure. about animation. And the Academy Museum is just theatrical animation. It's not TV animation or independence. I would love to see a museum of all animation, just celebrating animation as a whole. Um, I don't know. It, it, museums are very expensive to pull off. And um, I have great hopes for the one that there's one on um, visual storytelling that I think George Lucas was behind here in LA. And I'd love to see what that turns into. Hmm. Um, but the problem with museums is that it's physical objects that are collecting dust on a shelf you know it's almost like bottling up history like like specimens in formaldehyde i'd rather figure out how to get that material out to the world over the internet so that it can actually get used to make new things like you say ivan Earl backgrounds uh, an ebook that has a hundred of them can tell you uh, with high resolution scans that where you can actually see every brush stroke that gets out to hundreds of animators all over the world can make more of an impact than a framed original painting hanging on a wall with a little white card next to it that says Ivan Earl on it can ever do. So I, someone may do this. I, I don't know if I'm the person to do it, um, but someone should do a, you know, a, there we go. Someone should. Mm -hmm. It's a million. <laughs> I always resist that because everybody, <laughs> yeah. Who's the, a millionaire would be able to do it. So yeah, <laughs> but, 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 yeah, I would like to see that. And, and I, you know, we've got incredible things that, that um, we've scanned at high resolution in our archive that will never be seen by anybody. They're parts of private collections of major collectors that, you know, a museum can only have so much in it. It's like even the Louvre, uh, sure. has trouble buying new Van Goghs at this point because it's just too expensive. A museum only has what it has, but a digital archive can, a person can bring a masterpiece to me. I can digitize it and hand the masterpiece back to them. They can keep it. They can hang it on their living room wall and it can get used by people all over the world to create new art too. So that's kind of a win-win. That's why I'm kind of focused on digital as opposed to uh, a physical museum. Oh, well, these days with the, all the pop-up things that come up, the Van Gogh pop-up or uh, all the different things, it seems like at some point they should be able to do one with the animation art or something like that where you can go in and experience it for a month or two and see how it gets result, how people like it. Absolutely, and that, that Van Gogh uh, pop-up was all digitized images. They didn't have actual paintings. There. Yeah. It was it was all digitized. So, you know, the medium mm -hmm. is expanding of mm -hmm. what we can do. Animation is so wonderful. Uh, there's so much so many different aspects to it. I'd love to see exhibits like that of animation. Going through the site, I'm I've been a member for a while. I had to stop for a while, but I was always impressed by all the different books and illustration things that you guys would 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 find, and it was just the the wealth of information. I mean, I'm not an animator or an illustrator, but I enjoy seeing the process and the creativity that goes into it. And man, you guys come up with some amazing things. I think there was one with Ralph Baschke did something with some kind of book that he donated or. Mm -hmm. And and that was available on the, on the on the repack, and that was really man, it was awesome. Ralph lent us uh, his drawing course, the Eugene Zimmerman I mentioned him earlier, and it was a I think nineteen or twenty books, twenty little booklets, and it was a correspondence course, and he found it in a in a uh, garage sale, and immediately recognized the value of it, and he said I. I kept this hidden in my desk so no one else would ever see it because it was my secret weapon. <laughs> so now I'm sharing that with you and <laughs> you can share it with all of your kids and, and students all over. And uh, 
will make animation great. <laughs> so yeah, that the the um, how to drawing materials are are very important. And there's that connection between the hand and, and paper that is so important with a pencil and all that sort of st sort of stuff. But CG tools are now get approaching the point where it can be like paper. And essentially animation now is not even made with pencils and paper anymore. It's made with Cintiqs and uh, tablets and, and uh, styluses. And artists are doing just as incredible things with digital tools as they ever did with pencils. Computer art tends to be a little bit I don't know, it has a look to it, but I think that's mostly because it's so new and we haven't had a time to really uh, incorporate it into the way artists actually work hmm. as well as it will maybe in 10 or uh, uh, 20 years or even further. You know, how long have have artists been grabbing a piece of charcoal and rubbing it on a rock, you know, it, they, <laughs> Long they're time. used to that. Yeah. It goes back to, to caveman days. So with, with, um, with the computer, the, the, the artwork on the computer, like the AI art, which is kind of has a big discussion a lot of times. You, are you a fan of, of the AI art or you, you think that's a good thing or? Well, any new tool has good and bad with it. Uh, I produced the first flash, animation, the first animated cartoon for the internet. We were trying to approach what TV animation could do, but other people took the same tool and said, oh, we're going to use this to cut corners and cheat. And, and it sucked. The problem wasn't the tool. It was the way that they were trying to remove artists from the process. AI, I don't think will replace artists. It'll be a tool that will actually be used by artists. If it can replace mechanical work, the sorts of things that we send overseas, um, or if it can take a rough from an artist and kind of elaborate on it a little bit, and then the, the artist can fine tune it at the back end, I think AI could be fantastic. Um, imagine you've got a show like The Simpsons where you always have the same living room that things take place in. Mm -hmm. Do you need to draw every living room background on your on your storyboard, or can you just say to the computer, "This one should be a living room background from this angle," and just let the computer do it? You know, mm -hmm. it, there are things that are creative and things that aren't creative. And the one right. thing that I learned as a producer was to try and do as much efficiently that wasn't creative. So artists could focus on the creative things and everything that's a mechanical and a technical um, chore that an artist doesn't have to do, that allows them more time to do creative things. Mm -hmm. And everyone's afraid of AI right now. And I understand that. And, you know, every six or eight years in animation, this is something animators know that, that maybe the general public doesn't, but Every six or eight years, there's like a, a major change in animation. And a lot of people fall away from the business. And some of them continue. And the first time that happened was the introduction of sound. And then they then color. You didn't have black and white cartoons anymore. Then theatrical cartoons ended. And you had TV animation. They had to develop that. In my era, that when I've been an animation producer, you know, in the beginning, it was shipping animation overseas. Um, the end of Saturday morning television. That still hurts me. Yeah, you had to find other places to, to put cartoons because Saturday morning wasn't there anymore. Mm -hmm. The decline of the big hand-drawn animated features like the Disney ones. Um, new ways of doing animation with computers, antiques and CGI and digital ink and paint and flash animation and you know, and, and there were people that said, I'll never draw on a Cintiq. I only do paper and pencil. Well, those people aren't working anymore. Right. And there are people that say, you know, uh, uh, CG is terrible. Well, they're, they're storyboard artists. They're, a storyboard for CG is the same as storyboard for hand drawn. So now it's AI. And I think AI will find its place in the workflow. Flow. There will be people who will be able to work with it. 
that uh, take it to do great things. And there'll be others who will use it as cheat and will do terrible things. <laughs> yeah. And there'll be people who just go on to other fields because they aren't interested in doing it that way. It's good. It's bad. It's indifferent. It's, <laughs> it's yeah. just different that, you know, if you want to see good examples of AI done well, obviously it's very early. Go to YouTube and search Netflix Boy and Dog. I don't know if you've seen that film yet. Mm -mm. It's a film where they did all the, it's an anime short where they did all of the um, backgrounds with AI. And at the end of the thing, over the end credits, they show how they used AI to do it. An artist did a rough sketch of what he wanted the composition to be. AI took it and interpreted that into being an environment that the character could inhabit. And then at the end, the artist came in and painted over the top of that environment to make it look the way that he wanted it. So it works really well and you would never know that it was AI. You'd say those are beautiful backgrounds. Uh, so there are ways to incorporate it. Another thing that I haven't heard anyone talk about this yet, but I'm really interested in, in AI as an ideation tool. I went to design school and we had a instructor who told us to, gave us an assignment for our first day of class to solve a problem, create a product that will solve this problem. And he sent us home and it was like five minutes and, and he sent us home on our first day of class. Oh. Just handed <laughs> out the, the assignment and left. Uh -huh. And we're doing, okay, we go home, we solve the problem, we come back, we pin up all of our our solutions to the problem. And he looks them over, he says, oh, there's some wonderful ideas here, this is great. Okay, now I want every one of you to go home and find a hundred more solutions to that problem. <laughs> <laughs> he said, first idea is your worst idea. No rules, it can be balloons and, and carrier pigeons, um, crazy ideas because a crazy idea might lead to thinking outside the box and coming up with an idea that, that works. So I can see AI being used like, um, I don't know if you ever heard of Exquisite Corpse, which was what the Dadaists used to do back in, in the turn of the century. They, they would fold a paper in thirds and one of them would draw a head and hand it to the next one and fold his head out of the way so the person couldn't, the artist couldn't see it. And then the next person would do the shoulders to the waist and then the last person would do the legs. And then they'd open it up and look what people had created. And it would be this crazy combination of bird and animal and, and person. And, uh -huh. and they'd come up with crazy ideas that way. And I can see AI being used like that exquisite corpse to say, here's an idea. Like there's a guy named Dougie Pledger, D-U-G-G-Y Pledger. P-L-E-D-G-E-R. And he has a website called Dougie.com. What he did with AI was he said, cross Disneyland with a horror movie. Then he started feeding all this information into, into the AI and programming it. And it came up with these incredible photographic images of Mickey Mouses with fangs and, and mm -hmm. uh, horrible uh, castles on fire and and people running through the streets on <laughs> through mm -hmm. main street mm -hmm. and just incredible images. And I can see turning AI loose and saying, give me 500 crazy ideas. And then an artist looks at them and goes, Oh, 90% of these are terrible. Mm -hmm. But the one or two that might give them an idea that then they can run with. And I can really see AI as being used in that way for, for coming up with crazy ideas, but we'll see if people actually, actually do that or not. That's what I would use. I would just sit and, you know, and, and press the, the mix button again and, and see <laughs> if I can combine mice with, with dogs and mm -hmm. create all sorts of unholy alliances between things. <laughs> mm -hmm. Sort of brainstorming, but taking advantage of what's been done before. Yeah, feeding a whole bunch of material together that doesn't go together and hitting blend mm -hmm, and seeing what mm -hmm, comes out. Mm -hmm. Hitting mix, <laughs> yeah. 
I don't yeah. think that would work good for a chef, but <laughs> yeah, that <laughs> sounds terrible for artist. food. Yeah, but art, yeah, yeah art's pretty. Uh, it's pretty adventurous. Uh huh. Well, see, we could probably keep you here for another hour. We certainly uh, have enough questions for you for another hour. Um, but before I let you go, is there anything you'd like to share with the audience, and particularly if you're looking for projects, help with, or fundraising, something like that? I have a theory about nonprofits, and that that's to build up one step at a time. We're always looking for more members, people who join us, people who volunteer. That's that is our success. That's how we measure our success because. With each person that joins, we can do a little bit more. Hmm. You know, there are charities that have pictures of earthquake victims or kids in wheelchairs, poster childs. We we don't have that kind of thing. So we take the tortoise route rather than the hare. I think what we're doing is important. And I think we're building the foundation for the future of an art form, uh, cartooning, illustration, animation. And that's incredibly important, but you can't reduce that down to a single image for fundraising very well. I've, I've tried and failed millions of times. <laughs> or a slogan. Yeah, we kind of have to explain mm -hmm. in long form for people to really understand. But I saw a documentary that pointed out that civilization is synonymous with art. We think of civilization being invading armies and Caesar and Genghis Khan and um, things like that, but governments and conquerors don't last. Another one comes along and then the old Pharaoh's name gets scratched off the temple walls and they start over again. Mm -hmm. the, but the thing that lasts is art. Mm -hmm. There are cultures like in South America where all we know about them is the art that they left behind. Mm -hmm. But that's enough because art reflects humanity. It reflects who we are. And it's a constant presence in human existence, going all, all the way, like we said, back to cave paintings. So animation resources is, is all about, if I had to put it in a nutshell, I would say it's all about trying to let our followers know that animation isn't ducks or rabbits or princesses or space princes with swords or talking dogs or any of that stuff. It's about expressing yourself as an artist, reflecting the world around you, commenting on it, uh, pointing out all the things that we recognize and share as humans. They say, you know, the pen is mightier than the sword. Well, they also say a picture is worth a thousand words. So a really good cartoon has the ability to be more powerful than a thousand swords. And history is full of cartoonists who changed the world. Here's some breadcrumbs for you. Thomas Nast, Louis Raymakers, James Gilray, Herb Block, William Hogarth, Boris Artsy-Bashev, uh, David Lowe, the, the great, great artists that changed the world. And you don't read about them in history books because they're too busy talking about Genghis Khan. So you don't realize how important artists are. The Pieta, Guernica, Nude Descending a Staircase, Goya's Capriccios, Starry Night, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Art can change the world. In my not too terribly humble opinion, animation may be the greatest artistic medium of them all. So reducing that, to talking dogs and princesses is a mistake. So what I'm trying to do is build a foundation where we learn from the past and we take it to the future bigger and better than ever before. And I see a lot of kids and I see a lot of technology and I see a lot of artists with passion that are 100% excited about taking it there. Um, so if you want to be a part of that, join Animation Resources. If you join, it's less than $100 a year, and you get a new reference pack every, every month just full of ideas and full of art and full of treasures. Um, it's the best deal in, for artists. Makes a great Christmas gift. <laughs> There's, there's my slogan. Animation <laughs> Resources memberships make a great 
Christmas gift for your your favorite artist. Well, it also opens people's <laughs> minds to creativity more because they see things and they it, they they can visualize things that they can't do as much now these days. So it gives them a whole new outlook, perspective. Absolutely, and creativity and and uh, that is the essence of everything. And and I I looked at your podcasts and I saw the list of people you're talking to the common denominator there is creativity you have an awful lot of creative people that have, have been in your podcasts over the over the past few years and i think that's great and i i think all creative people should be should be getting together and and celebrated yeah celebrate your art form push it forward do things that have never been done before and and there's no reason why we can't we don't have to look at you know, the golden age of Disney and Bugs Bunny as being the best animation ever made anymore. We can, we can look at today and say, we're living in a golden age right now. That's, that's what I'm aiming for. Well, your work is really inspiring and your explanation of what you do is also really oh, inspiring. Yeah. Yes. Thank you so much for that. And thank you for coming on the show. It's been so fun to talk to you. I hope you keep in touch with us too, as things develop and you have news for us. Keep us in mind. Will do. Don't forget, if you're not already, I highly recommend becoming a member of Animation Resources. With the bi-monthly reference packs curated by our board, the bonus archive, and the podcasts, you will have a great start at building your personal library of reference material that will serve you for your entire artistic career. And it's a huge bargain. It's only $70 per year if you're a student or educator, and $95 per year for the general membership. There's also a quarterly billing membership, which is $30 every three months. You can sign up right now at animationresources.org slash membership. One more time, that's animationresources.org slash membership.